Hello guys and welcome to the last part of this paper from the Northwest uh, during these trial exams of 2022. So we'll be doing the functions since we've done most of the paper one already. So well you will look in the description of this video and you'll find a link to the part one of the same paper in case you missed it. You just saw this one. Okay guys. Um, we have functions upon us here, which we need to work a little bit with, okay? So, all is fine. Um, let's just do, let's just do something about this one, okay? Um, question four starts off by telling us that below are the graphs of f of x equals minus 2. Again, you know that this format minus 2 into x plus p that squared plus q. We know that this is still a, right? So our a is less than 0. If a is less than 0, we expect our parabola to be a grumpy face, okay? At this point, we really don't know where is our turning point because Everything is just not there, okay? But it's not a big deal. So we are expecting a graph that looks like that. Can we see it here? Of course, there it is, and it confirms that that is our f, okay? Not a problem. And then, of course, this vertex form or the so called turning point form is actually telling you that p would represent the x coordinate of the turning point and Q would represent the corresponding Y coordinate of that turning point. Okay, then G of X equals minus 3 over X, okay? So what do we know about minus 3? This is essentially A for this function. It is also less than 0. So you know that when A is less than 0, what is the story? We expect the graph to be in the second quadrant so to speak and fourth quadrants okay where that is the x is sorry this is y not x okay so again we're looking for a graph that looks like that and of course if you look at the bottom here there is no shift so basically there's a silent plus zero here or minus zero but let's just say it's a plus zero so obviously when we solve for x for the denominator we will have x equals to 0. And can we divide by 0? The answer is no. And it means this function becomes undefined. And that tells us the asymptote is at uh, the y-axis. So as you can see here, the y-axis doesn't get crossed by this graph. So it's the shape that we expect. And it's doing exactly what you expect for it not to cross or touch the y-axis because that line y equals 0 or the x-axis where x is 0 is undefined so it becomes our vertical asymptote and then we have our n over there that n is basically our horizontal asymptote which is probably that one because this is the x-axis so that should be the asymptote and where do this asymptote come together they come together at that point, okay? So the point of confluence of the asymptotes or intersection of the asymptotes marks the center of our function, okay? That is the center of, of our graph. All right, not a problem. And we know that the axis of symmetry passes there. So this line passing through here already tells us that it must be one of the axis of symmetry. That means one with the positive gradient. All right, and of course, this graph is symmetrical about this line, okay, such that this portion is the inverse of this one, and that one is the inverse of that one, okay? Not a big deal, okay? Now that is fine. We've done a little bit of an analysis. Let's see what is going on. H of x equals n. We can see that. So n is a function of h of x, okay? Which is an asymptote of g. It is also a tangent to f. So if it is the tangent to f, we know that great, it already tells us that its 
value is essentially the y coordinate of that turning point okay and then the line r of x equals x plus 8 is an axis of symmetry okay so this line here again once you see 8 there maybe let's use this one that it doesn't eliminate this nicely so you see that 8 is the y-intercept of the line so of course this is the y-axis and this line cuts the y-axis at 8 okay so it already gives us this point i mean we know this is the y-intercept so x is zero there and then y is eight so we already have the coordinates of this point of intersection therefore it is zero and eight and once we have this point we can go back and say it means our graph is essentially given by this function minus three over x already x is 0 but this is a plus 8 right because that is q q is the y coordinate of the intersection of those asymptotes okay not a problem so already they're giving us this function somehow rather indirectly okay and then we're looking at this one here it says now r of x equals x plus 8 also intersects the axis of symmetry of f so basically this is the axis of symmetry of f meaning it is the point sorry it gives us the x coordinate of the turning point so this line here is being intersected by this one at this point e which is m is to 7 okay so not a problem um, knowing that this point lies on this equation we can actually work out what m is and all we do here we just say for an uh, not an x intercept per se but we substitute y with 7 then when we transpose the 8 to the 7 we get minus 1 so x becomes minus 1 so we know that here our graph is actually doing the x-axis i mean it's cutting the x-axis at minus 1 ne? Not a problem. So in essence, it gives us the value of our E, I mean, sorry, of our M. So that means the X coordinate M is essentially minus one. And we already know that the turning point therefore is minus one is to eight, okay? So then we can essentially say P is a plus one, right? Because we always take the opposite sign of what P is for the x coordinate so the x coordinate is minus one then when we, when we put it back into that position it becomes a plus one so essentially we are also being told that our f of x essentially is turning out to be f of x equals minus two into x plus one all squared plus eight okay this is just the interpretation of the information they are giving us and of course the sketch that is before us okay it's not a big deal remember you're not just going to show up with these things when you're doing your answers you have to show us or show the examiner or whoever is marking that you understood the given information and this was sort of um, interpretation of that information all right so I don't think there's much we can do at this point. Is there any more we can say about what they gave us? So guys, I'll advise you that whenever you get a sketch and a piece of information, read that piece of information. And of course, use a bit of your theory to revise some of the things that are stated there and see if you can recognize most of those things there. But of course, don't overly do it. You don't have time. So as quickly as you can, but key areas especially statements that you're provided make sure you have an understanding of what they do into your sketch so that you don't struggle too much when you finally get to the solutions all right guys but i think at this point i am happy okay maybe the other thing we can say there is that d is also minus one uh, i don't know if we really have to show it so this d is essentially 
falling on this line of the axis of symmetry of the parabola so it is minus 1 but we probably would need to look for what is its corresponding y value which we don't have at this point so after this I mean we can start working out our answers as quickly as we can let us see where does this ship take us so we're doing question four. Okay. Question four is uh, four point one. Four point one says write down the domain. Once they say write, you don't have to show us how you determined it. Write down the domain of G. So that is the hyperbola. Of course, we can see that the hyperbola doesn't cross this line. And that means it cannot take an x value that is a zero. Because when you assess the domain, you're looking at the x values as they stretch from the center to the left or to the right. And then, of course, we can tell that if this line doesn't get crossed, it means we never have x as a zero. So that point is excluded. But every other x value going in that direction and going in that direction is acceptable. So, I mean, from theory already, you would know that the domain of a hyperbola is that x is an element of real numbers with just the exceptions at the, or I mean, vertical asymptote. Or, if you didn't really think about it graphically, if you get this expression, you know that x is on the denominator for this function. Then it means we cannot divide by zero. So, whatever else value is, it's acceptable except zero because the function becomes undefined. So to answer this question, we can say the domain. Okay. Is equal to a set of x values such that x is an element of real numbers. Okay. But there is a restriction that x is not equal to 0. Because if x is 0, our graph is undefined. So you get your mark there, and for that restriction, you get your two marks. Yeah. And then, of course, you may still say x is an element of negative infinity going into 0. And both of them are not included because we cannot include zero. Infinity is never included. Union, you start with zero this side, going to positive infinity. Again, both of them are not included. But the, the, the thing to note about the intervallic notation, it is that you must know that x must be an element of real numbers for you to do it. Or any parameter that you are trying to portray in this manner it must be an element of real numbers. Otherwise, if it is not, then you are not allowed to use this format. Okay? So you still have another x. You can say x is less than 0 or x is greater than 0. That is still acceptable. So how you write this is totally up to your own choice. Except this one. You need to make sure that before you write that, you have real values for this otherwise it's a problem all right so that is fine we took our two marks there next one says calculate the value of m okay m is the x coordinate of e which lies on the line uh, rx equals sorry rx is equal to x plus 8 so we can actually do the calculation and enforce. Of course, they are saying calculate. We can say E, which is M is 2, 7, lies on, oops, not F of X, but R of X equals X plus 8. Okay. This implies that uh, 7 is equal to m plus 8. Therefore, our m is going to be minus 1. That's how we work it out. Of 
course, every time you always try to explain how you got your things. Remember, as much as it feels like it's an unnecessary exercise and that it's really ridiculous, you're wasting time, but if you pay attention to the instructions, I'm just going to point you quickly into those instructions. Now, if you look at this instruction here, I know you guys always overlook these things. If you look here, it says clearly show all calculations, diagrams, graphs, etc. that you used. You see there's an etc. That means even other things that are not mentioned here. If you've used them to determine your answers, please indicate those things. This includes reasons. Don't say since it's not Euclidean geometry, I'm not going to provide a reason for some postulations I make. Don't assume that they understand. Of course, the assumption is that they do. But real, in reality, in an exam, it's as if nobody knows anything and you are the only one who does. And they are assessing you for your knowledge. Now, remember that part, etc. It means anything that you have done. Should it be something that is rather elusive, please bring it to the light so that no one says you copied or you just flopped it or whatever reason. Some people can be brutal when they mark, others are very fair. At the end of the day, you also have the responsibility to follow the general instructions unless the local instructions are saying otherwise, okay? So please guys, don't take these things for granted. They will hurt you if you're not careful. So of course, if that is the case, then we can already tell that E is this point minus one is to oops seven but i mean that was not the question so we're just doing this conclusion for ourselves 4.3 what do they want 4.3 says write down you see they're not asking you to determine it i saying write down the value of n and we realized that n is effectively the y-intercept of this line which is also the y-intercept of um, this line r of x. So we can just write here without fear that n is equal to 8. So they should just write. So one mark. I didn't really give us a mark for the, for the above. Of course, the substitution and the mark, I mean the final answer, you get your two marks. All right, not a problem. Uh, let's keep moving. So, what do we have here? It says now, given that f of x is equal to minus 2 into x plus p plus q, write down. Again, this time they are being lenient. They don't expect you to explain. You can explain to yourself. You can do it on your rough work if you want. But we've already interpreted our graph nicely, so they are really making it easy by saying, just write down the values of p and q. We can see that the x coordinate at the turning point is at minus 1. We can tell that the y coordinate of the turning point is at 8 on the y axis. So we know that we can say 4.4p is definitely equal to 1. Remember, p always takes the opposite sign of your x coordinate of the turning point. And then q is as it is on the graph the equation and everywhere else. So Q is going to be 8. Okay. Easy stuff. So again, two marks for those two. Then we're going to 4.5. It says, if it is given that F of X equals, so they're giving us an equation. So they made it too easy so that we don't have to sort it out ourselves. So they're saying calculate the X intercepts of F. Okay. Easy question again. 4.5. So we are told f of x is minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 6, okay? So we know here that 4x intercepts, it implies that y is equal to 0, which also implies that now minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 6 is equal to 0 also implies that we can try and divide throughout by minus 2 here because 
it is divisible by that so this will be such that we have x squared plus 2x minus 3 equal to 0 okay and then we can factorize this implies that we have to look for factors now of uh, this quadratic so it's going to be x and x and then we have a positive in the middle term and the negative in the last term so this one the big number must take the positive the smaller number take the negative so factorization is key therefore x is 1 or x is minus 3 okay not a problem and therefore our x intercepts such that we have 1 and 0 and minus 3 is to 0 okay not a problem good stuff so that is our answer there right, right there okay three marks they're giving us three marks so I do believe here first of all doing that factorization and finding those values is important the rest is a means to an end which we still want but you won't be rewarded for doing it it is the law so you have to follow the law unfortunately and for no benefit per se okay but the law can protect you though <laughs> that's just a good thing about it okay let's go on what is the question here now oh by the way let's just try and figure out once you get a bit of information always try and put that down on your graph <laughs> always try so it tells you and I that this graph is cutting here this must be one ne? I don't know why this pen is refusing me so that is one and then it's cutting there so they are telling you and I that that is minus three I should, my position though is not helping me I already have a bad writing but it's worsened by this situation over here but look I have a bit of a concern here do you realize that this line if you're looking for its x-intercept it becomes minus 8 now do you see this line cuts before this point and this is meant to be minus 8 right here but look the parabola is cutting at minus 3 which is a point after that I mean come on man this sketch is incorrect totally wrong I mean I know things are not drawn to scale but come on this misrepresentation where you would have a value that is less showing before like this because I mean this arrow I've just drawn is minus 8 because it's the x-intercept of this line from that equation and then we have a 3 here so I mean come on this sketch is misleading totally misleading I understand it's not drawn to scale but look at the one here from 0 to 1 is such a short distance but look at 0 to minus 1 is quite a big chunk of a distance so this is definitely not quite a good this is not a good uh, sketch at all yes theoretically we can work it out but come on man it doesn't have to be this wrong uh, it can't be it just cannot be so, um, yeah, that is it for now. But yeah, I think this question was not well designed. Of course, purely because of the structure. Whoever drew this, mm -mm. no, 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 that's not a bit, that's not fair. It's not fair. But hey, it's okay. It's done now. What can you do about it? All right. The question says now, calculate um, the axis of symmetry of f sorry the axis of symmetry of f intersects the graph of g at d okay determine the coordinates of d All right. so someone is trying to reach me i don't know why and I, I cannot answer right now because if i start i may be in a situation so to avoid it let's just not answer right right Hey, 
not you, not you, not you, not you. You will not be very clear. Already this one is not so clear when you watch these videos back. So if I use something else, it's going to be even worse. So 4.6. First of all, we know that g of x is equal to minus 3 over x plus 8. You have to make that declaration, okay? Although they didn't ask you, but we've already determined these parameters there, that it's 0 and 8, okay? So we can say now d, d is minus 1 and y lies on d, I mean on g. Okay, such that we will have here y equals minus 3 over minus 1 plus 8. This becomes 3 plus 8, which is 11. Okay, we can say therefore d is minus 1 and 11. Answer. Okay. Um, maybe here you can provide a reason that here the x at d equals the x at e given that e d or d e is a vertical line. Okay. That's fine. But even if you didn't say it, it's a bit fair to take it because they said statements that suggest so. All right. Um, how many marks for that too? Okay, I guess the correct substitution and finding that 11 is all that matters. So 4.7, what is the story there? 4.7 says the equation of the tangent to g at point d sorry, determine the equation of the tangent to g at point d. Write down your answer in the form y equals bx plus c, okay? That's going to require us to do a bit of work. All right, so let's see, where is this tangent? Where is this tangent? Uh, this one doesn't really... Sh uh, ish, my colors are not the best, but let's check a better color that we can use here that is my ruler not a marula I want the ruler okay um, I mean you don't really have to waste your time doing this but I'm just doing it for fun okay it is for fun from you but I'm sure it may not be that much fun for you because it's an absolute waste of time. So that is the tangent we're trying to solve here. Then you need to be on foot. And why is the last year I Yeah, okay. Eh, 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 Okay. Now, let's see what is going on here. So, we want that, and we have a point. Remember, we are told from calculus that we can actually determine the gradient of a curve at any point by knowing very well that the gradient at a particular point on the curve is equal to the tangent's gradient at that particular point. So, if we can find the gradient of g at d, we effectively have the gradient of our tangent at that same point okay now since you know calculus guys remember try to do derivatives of each of those functions that you deal with especially the curvy ones that is hyperbola parabola and cubic function of course the the first two parabola and cubic function you're already well versed with that so it's much easier to do it but for hyperbola, it's not quite a common question. But yeah, 
it's something that you need to do I have not really seen a paper before that asked you to do this but I have applied this in some of the videos that I did um, to answer a certain question that was interpretatory in nature but on the graph that involved a hyperbola so I guess some of these guys do have a look at times or at times these ideas do come to their minds so let's be glad we are able to even be a step ahead at times okay not a problem let's see we need the gradient of that then we have this point determined just now so we can use that point to find the final answer okay let's start here how can we express g we can express g of x firstly in this manner this is minus 3 times x to the minus 1 so you move this guy from the denominator to the numerator because you cannot differentiate when you have a fraction yeah, it's dangerous don't do it plus 8 okay the rules of differentiation I mean, you follow them that you must not have a denominator you must not have thirds and uh, yeah let's just leave it at that so so far now we know that fine we know that at the same time that the gradient of the tangent of just 10 is equal to the derivative of g you can say at point d ne? because that is the point of tangency for the two it's a very important statement this one okay this implies that m of the tangent is equal to now we do the derivative of g here at point d so we will have ourselves here minus times minus is going to be 3 x to the minus 1 plus 8 okay great stuff which is going to be I sorry minus 2 not minus 1 remember you you take my you take one from that when you differentiate using the power rule all right so what do we do here um, I, I don't know why I did that but I did it then we can convert this into something ish I'm showing up with this 8 it does not exist remember a derivative of a constant is nothing so that is all we have but we would want to express this as a positive exponent it's much easier like that then we can say that gradient is going to be 3 into 1 squared okay which is just 3 not a problem why am I putting 1 because point D is 1 minus sorry that is minus 1 not 1 that is minus 1 and 11 okay so minus 1 squared is 1 therefore we end up with that gradient we can say therefore the line of the tangent is such that y equals 3x plus c and then through point d which is minus 1 and 11 we will have 11 equals 3 into minus 1 plus c therefore c is this is minus 3 crossing over it gives us 14 all right therefore y equals 3x plus 14 so we are sorted okay I mean you can go about it as quickly as possible you don't have to be as comprehensive as I am but look I always try to cover all my bases so that I have no reasons to cry when some things don't make sense that I mean I've done it correctly but why am I losing marks the reason is you did not show clearly some of the things but I mean that is subjective rather than objective at best because yeah there's a lot of assumptions that need to be accepted at this point not a problem um, what do you want the gradient what do you want the derivative and what do you want the y-intercept and of course the equation so we have four marks here where is the fifth mark well I don't know man but the fifth mark probably comes from this statement 
you may give a mark there or a correct substitution somewhere either there or here it really doesn't matter but at the end of the day if you've done it correctly and it's all clear they will find a way to give you a mark that belongs to you all right back where to let's see what is the next question next question says determine the equation of k of x in the form kx equals a over x plus t plus s if k is the reflection of g about the line the sun they have never asked a question like this unless I don't know very well, but I have not seen something like that where you're reflecting about another line. Mm, okay, but if you think about it, this is a vertical line. Ne? Let's just draw it. Let's draw it so that we can understand what they're driving us into. They're taking us somewhere for sure. Let's just try and work on our sketch. I mean, this sketch is already a mess, so. I'll try and get a space that is essentially maybe as spaced out as that one. How many centimeters is that? So it's one comma one comma two. So let's just do a one comma two here, just to give ourselves a bit of a better space. Because this is already a ridiculous situation. This 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 diagram is just disappointing. But K is in this entire part quantity. So the slalom is very easy. Because in this entire slalom, this is negative. The phone is just slalom number zero. But I look now. It's longer than that. All right. Let's go again. We have to go to the second. All right. Um. Let's just say this is the line x equals 2 so we are saying we have 2 here at that point where this line cuts the x-axis okay so we are reflecting our hyperbola about this line all right so what is that basically if we are reflecting about a vertical line that's a horizontal reflection so the horizontal reflection is effectively a reflection about the y-axis so that means we just multiply every x value by negative in the original. But there is a bit of a situation that we need to think about. Um, if you look here, where is the center of this graph? The center of this graph, sorry. Um, yes, the center of this graph is here. If you look, how far is this center? I always prefer to use the center when I'm going to do certain flips or flops. Ne? The flips and flops you need to use a, a point that is identifiable because other points may be a little bit challenging to use so the center is usually better so if you look at the center how far is it from this line it is two units because it's from zero to two so you moved horizontally two units that means when we flip this graph about this line the center should maintain that distance from this line but of course this time it's going to be on the other side so that means our center here will have to go exactly two units, meaning we will have our new center here. Okay. So where will that center be at? If we read it down, remember that was two units to two, and then a further two units takes us to four. Okay. So that means our new center here is going to be minus four sorry not minus 4 but it's going to be 4 and 8 okay so our new center here becomes 4 and 8 okay so this is the same as we just did a horizontal reflection or a reflection about the y-axis and then after that we dragged this graph or translated it horizontally four units to the right okay so 
that is the idea that I get from this type of a question although it's not quite a common type of a question but yeah you always expect a few tricks every now and then isn't it because things that you've not done before they know that you know enough to be able to work them out so I would believe that that is where this is taking us so we effectively are doing a reflection about the y-axis and then translating that four units to the right because you see the only thing that changes here is the x coordinates while the y coordinates change but effectively the shape of the graph also changes because what was in the second quadrant will now appear in the first quadrant okay to show that this is a flip as opposed to just a translation alone so we flipped and translated so this is the effect of this line okay it's just three marks all right not a problem so now that we have a bit of an understanding of what is what went on in the we can now attack 4.8 we can say well a reflection of g of x about the line y not y but x equals to 2 is effectively a, re, a horizontal horizontal reflection of G about the Y axis and then translated four units to the right. Okay. This is such that, uh, uh, what can I say? Yeah. Okay. Such that we know that our k of x is going to be equal to uh, minus 3 uh, over minus x minus x yeah this is the first thing we do it's minus x plus 8 all right this is the horizontal reflection we're starting with this one the reason is I'm starting here this is the horizontal reflection okay or you can say a reflection about the y-axis which would effectively tell me that I have 3 over x plus 8. And then we can say this translated to the right. You can say now this function, so you can write a full word there, don't write that. This function translated to the right for units. Is such that k of x is equal to 3 over x minus 4. Remember, when you translate to the right, you minus 4 plus 8. Okay, it is such that k of x is therefore that expression x minus 4 plus 8. Okay, I mean, for 3 marks, guys, this is crazy. There's two things you have to do, but in any case, before to ah, again, say I'll go get log. So the horizontal reflection part, this is the translation to the right effectively, and maybe to then say lovely stuff here. Um, maybe this a little bit of explanation as to how you went about it, because remember, like I said. If they say show all your workings and whatever you used, even this explanation is key because then it makes people understand what you are doing. Because I can tell you, if you're not systematic about these things, think about it. If you were to just complex this thing there already, 
you are going to run into a problem, right? Because you would be forced to put this negative in there and then pull it out and then what happens? That cancels and then it becomes a plus four. Then it becomes now an opposite shift. So these kind of things can be quite technical if you don't have a game plan. All right, three marks, guys, easy. Of course, I just chose to use the interpretation, but you can still say that if this is reflected about this line, it means the new um, intersection of the asymptotes is going to be minus four and eight. Once you state that, you can say therefore the k of x is. So that one is even shorter, so maybe that would be enough to say the new center or intersection of your asymptotes is 4 and 8 then you can say and then of course on your sketch draw this line show these distances that you're talking about in this point so that if anyone for any reason doesn't believe you or doesn't see it they can actually start to see it okay not a problem so we've sorted this one three marks in the bag 4.9 the last question here what do they want determine the value or values of k for which the equation uh, g of x plus 4 now what do you do here do you see we keep playing around this hyperbola I've never seen so many questions on it but it's fine we know all of these things theoretically so we can follow them so we are translating this graph to the left this time four units because when you say plus you're, you're taking it to the left four units and then we're adding k which is a vertical shift remember when you add a constant it's a vertical shift equal to zero we'll have a root less than five okay you can already see here that okay three marks maybe it's something easy to tell so what happens here we're shifting this graph to the left uh, four units all right so let's focus here where was our center it was at four and eight but do we really need the center not really the center is not critical at this point we want an x-intercept you can see here the x-intercept is here between one and two but of course looking at this graph not being so accurate so we may not even be at one we may actually find ourselves that this point is less than that as well uh, let's just check here what happens when we say y is 0 transpose 8 it becomes minus 8 we multiply x we get minus 8x then we divide by minus 8 so it's going to be 3 over 8 see 3 over 8 is 0 comma 4 roughly which is less than 1 so this, this, this diagram is totally misleading and I mean to ask a question like this when this is already not kind of appropriate it's a bit challenging but let's see so which point can we look at I mean if we move this point let's say this is 0 comma 4 for example then we move it to the left 4 units that means we're going to subtract 4 right as much as this theoretically when you put it down it's a plus but when you're physically moving that point you're just going to subtract 4 this point takes us to minus 3.6 we don't get to 5 so this doesn't go to 5 so already we know that shifting this to this side doesn't really help huh? it doesn't give us an x coordinate I mean an x intercept that is less than 5 so even if we move it up in its new position of 3. Uh, eight. Let's just try and create this shape. This thing is quite useful, guys. Don't throw these things away when you buy a new phone or something. If you, or even your parents buy a new phone, ask for it. It will save you a lot of pain. So you see, I have a shape of our hyperbola. So we are moving it in to say three point. I mean, this was three already. So we went to three point six. Let's say it's over there. So this point, if we move it. We move it to that three point whatever so that would be our x intercept so it's not more than um it's not less than minus five it's greater than minus five here so when you move this thing up you see it doesn't really do it when you move it down it moves away so this means if we move it only at that point it doesn't help us now let's look at the other one 
what happens when we move this point say point D is the only point that we can identify that they gave us so always try to use what you have first and then figure out what else you can do so there is our graph so of course we are shifting it to uh, I mean five units back sorry four units back sorry so there we had minus one and then when we minus a four there it takes us to minus five exactly so our new point D is sitting where okay that is that one remove it back and say that is our point D let's just move it physically say there is our point D there and then we know that this point D there is sitting with minus 5 okay so understand these translations guys so all of these things try to interpret them you will see how easy this thing becomes so there is our point D I mean our 11 doesn't change so we found out that we were at 11 there so it doesn't change okay so now we are sitting here with our graph with point D doing its own thing here now when will we have an x-intercept remember this is still an asymptote at this point but when we do a vertical shift we shift everything asymptote when a graph when a center when a go on so classic so if we shift the lesions and a and guys we bumper action does and puzzle so if we shift this down do you see what becomes our x-intercept it becomes exactly minus five so if we shift it exactly down how many units was that remember this is 11 units this is eight units so if we take down our asymptote to eight basically we will still be above this line slightly but if we shift it less than eight units less than eight is going to be somewhere around say minus nine or so minus nine will drive us to around minus one let's say minus nine for that matter so okay let's just first check the difference between 11 and 8 it's two units so we know that if we took it down to 8 we would be two units above that okay so fine and then if we take it two units down say to minus 2 then this one sits exactly there so that is minus 10 right so if we take it say our vertical shift is minus 10 which is less than minus 8 right so it's going to take us to exactly our x-intercept our, our x-intercept unfortunately ah and so this is what happens now this is the story there we will have exactly that point so when will we have an x-coordinate if we move this feather down you will see some magic if we move this feather down what is the problem you realize that our x-intercept actually moves ahead of this point it's going to be over there if we keep moving down our x-intercept keeps moving forward it keeps moving forward like that ne? until we get to that more or less vertical line where it doesn't really change much so it actually moves that one so we can not move beyond a certain number down and if we move say for example we don't really get our d to hit the intercept but we just fall just before so where is the x-intercept if we say we took it just one unit before maybe d is one unit above its position Let's say d is here look at that little big thing as, as our d so if d is still just a few moments before it hits the x-axis guess where is our x-intercept it's below where our minus 5 is so it means we have to shift this down after it has been reflected I mean shift or translated to the left we now have to shift it down a certain value <coughs> such that D is just above the x-axis then we will have an actual x x I mean an x-intercept that is less than minus 5 so now we have to play with the values which values must we do this for already we tell we, we could tell that this must be less than eight okay but now let's imagine what happens when we shift this one these 11 units because i mean we have two referen reference points because the vertical shift can be either eight units down 
I mean more than 8 say up to 10 and then we saw what happens right that is number 1 we can shift it down something more than 8 so we're going to say less than 8 because we want a number that will cancel out our 8 what else can we suggest we can suggest that um, what about this 11 because we can tell that our point is quite critical so if we move this thing 11 units down as well so if we take it 11 let's say 11 minus 11 it will take us to 0 ne? if we put this one at 0 we know that we'll be sitting at minus 5 so we just want this thing to be just above so that means we cannot take it 11 units down that means minus 11 we can't use minus 11 but let's say minus say 10 as we chose if we chose minus 10 we saw that this thing is 2 above 11 and then if we chose minus 10 minus 10 is less than minus 8 but greater than minus 11 so it takes us exactly to this position where our d is just 2 units above such that whatever else was there gives us that x coordinate I mean that x intercept over there so that means you can say k must be less than 11 sorry k must be less greater than minus 11 because you want to eliminate that down but k must also be less than minus 8 sorry must be less than minus 8 which is minus 9 minus 10 but we realize that minus 10 works best but it cannot be 11 because it gives us just minus 5 there so we need to stay above because if we stay even further below minus 11 we start to have our x-intercept moving closer again to the y-axis so this means the limit is that this value must be less than 8 meaning it should be in this region between 8 and whatever value that would be and that value is exactly at around 11 so in between here so we want something that is what less than minus 8 but greater than minus 11 so the issue here is just with the sun so you see the graph can help you a lot and trust me your magical tool <laughs> will do you an added effect of helping you so from the graph you just have to explain a little bit um, that this is what you can do you can say here well we know that g of x uh, g of x plus 4 plus k equals to 0 you can say is a graph of g translated to the left Four units and down k units okay great stuff now we saw that we can use our reference point D we can say therefore D is let's just say D prime is going to be minus it's what uh, minus 1 minus 4 is going to be minus 5 is to 11 okay that is the story and if that is the case we realized that well we can shift this down but not up to 11 because then we will get minus 5 because if we take this out and make it 0 then we will be sitting at that x intercept I mean this coordinate just gives you an understanding that look if we eliminate this 11 if we're doing our vertical shift it will take us down because we'll just sit at minus 5 but we want something less than minus 5 so what we're going to say here is that uh, then to have a root less than minus 5 it is therefore that k must be less than what we're saying minus 8 greater than minus 9 uh, minus 11 sorry because we don't want to eliminate this one but already we could tell that this thing must be between 8 and 1 
I don't know how to make up for this 8 in this statement, okay? I really can't. But I think it may make sense once you look at this coordinate that if you eliminate 11 exactly, you will sit at minus 5 in terms of your x-intercept. Okay, so I think that should be fine, guys. You get two marks for this. Maybe for this story here, boiling down to this, you get your third mark. Again, you don't have to stick with the graph only. You can just make a little bit of some mathematical calculation. You already have the gymnastics in the bag, so the other way you could answer 4.9 is to say, fine, if I have g of x plus 4 plus k equal to 0. This implies that I have what? What is g? Is minus 3 over x. But now x, you add 4, k, okay? And then plus 8, and then we're adding k, must be equal to 0. So you just work this out and then you'll be like, okay, let me solve for x here. How would I do it? I'm going to say minus 3 over x plus 4 equals, I transpose this constant to the side, I get minus 8 minus k. But I want to bunch this together into 1 because I want to start doing my cross multiplication to set up my x. Then this implies, I'm just going to rearrange, I'm going to have x plus 4 into minus 8 minus k. Now remember, if we consider this as a unit, just forget it is separate, otherwise you're going to run into problems. So if we consider this as a unit, don't break it as yet. Okay, then we're going to have here minus 3 when you say 1 minus uh, multiplied there. Then you can see here we may have to divide by minus whatever that is, minus 8 minus k. But treat it as a unit because, I mean, you would not have done it you can't do cross multiplication when you have terms. So that's why I'm punching it here. Okay, that one cancels. This follows that our x plus 4 is equal to uh, minus 3 over minus 8 minus k. Okay, now we want x. This implies also that x will be equal to minus 3 over minus 8 minus k. Then you transpose the 4 to this side. So this is basically how x will look like. This root we're looking for has this expression that represents it. And then we can say, therefore, we understand that for this to be less than 0, minus 3 over minus 8 minus k minus 4 must be less than minus 5, isn't it? Now you draw that inequality. And then, of course, what I would advise, this looks a bit long. You can do a lot of these things in your rough work. You can just write this expression, right? You write this one out because this is an interpretation of that. And then you can say, therefore, the root will be. You'll have done this in your rough work. You don't have to show it. You just say, therefore, the root will be this. And then you write this one down because you don't want this to be a, a too long calculation. Then, of course, we sort it out and then we say this implies what? Minus 3 over minus 8 minus k is less than you transpose, therefore we get minus 1 over 1. Then we still want to use our cross multiplicatory technique. This implies what? Now look here, we will multiply this. So when you cross multiply, the signs don't really affect what you what, what is happening there. So we're going to have minus 3 is less than here, minus into minus 8 minus k. Remember, don't rush. You see negatives, you treat them as such. And then we're like, no, we don't want the negative here. Because we want to break this without affecting our sign here. So we divide by minus 1, divide by minus 1. That takes out the, the negative, and then that takes out the negative which implies, now remember, once you do this side by side, you divide or you multiply side by side, the sign changes. So we know that 3 is going to be greater than minus 8 minus k. Now they are free. Now we transpose uh, 8 to the other side, right? This implies that 11 is greater than minus k. But we want k 
therefore k must be what? If this changes, it means k must be greater than minus 11, right? Or you can say 11 is less than a positive, minus 11 is less than k. This is the same as say k must be greater than minus 11. Okay, we only get one solution. And didn't we find something like that? in our expression. So we found that k should be greater than 11, but where is this piece? Now we go back to our root and say, hold on. But what? We know that minus 8 minus k cannot be equal to 0 for this to be real. Why? Because it's on the denominator. Okay. So we solve here. We can say minus k is not equal to 8. Therefore, k is not equal to minus 8, okay? So, now the question is, do we say less or do we say more? Now, this is when you go back and, and consult your graph. Sometimes some algebraic calculation may not reveal exactly what you need. So, you need the graph as well as a composite. So, this one is a bit more labor intensive. I mean, you're working for 3 marks, but it's as if you're working for 8 marks here. You look back in the graph, and then, of course, that interpretation we just did, guys, you can see that definitely I cannot take 8, right? Because if I take 8, it doesn't do anything for me. But I knew that whatever k value I must have, it must be less than 8. And, of course, greater than 11. So this interpretation comes back here. If you were not convinced you're doing the right thing, you can say, therefore, k must be less than minus 8 because you're going down so that's why I say less all right guys so you can say you now put this and that one k must be less than minus 8 greater than minus 11 and that makes sense because you can even follow graphically by putting something that can move and it gives you answers I mean of course you can see that this is a whole page working out just three marks but during your practice, during your study time, please try to figure out these things as well in other ways and keep refining your technique. You will see that you will lose nothing if you do these things because you will even be quick about this thing. This may look long, but you can actually do this in two minutes. You can really do this in two minutes, especially when you are confident. Okay, guys, so this is how this can be solved. And you can tell that this paper was not exactly easy. Ne? Yeah, it was not also easy for the one who sent this one because I, the graphs mm -mm, are disappointing. Okay, but where to? Let's keep moving. I don't plan to be very long today. I know I am a logoric guy. I have a lot of logoria. Sometimes I lose myself. I mean, when I watch these videos back, eh? yeah, <laughs> I'm like, is that me? Did I really say that? Yeah, I say a lot of things, man, that I don't even realize I'm saying. Yeah. Sometimes I'm saying multiply, you'll find me saying divide. So it's very difficult. I understand why teachers have it, you know, tough with their students. It's not easy. To do what they do so i applaud them for the good work that they do guys despite all these challenges that we face as a country and as the education system for those who are involved me i'm just an outsider guys just trying to look in so please everything i tell you double check it with your teachers or anyone to make sure it is appropriate because i don't know exactly the particulars of your syllabus at this point and i also don't know your exam guidelines so i may say things that probably your exams are against i don't know but you know as you attend school your teachers tell you all the time what is acceptable and what is not but here's the one thing i want to assure you though if you use mathematical principles or mathematical techniques and there is logic included and everything can be followed it cannot be punished it will be actually welcomed as another flavor 
to how we work things out. Okay, question five says, sketched below are the graphs of f of x equals 2x squared. Again, look at your a. Your a here is greater than zero. I think you're getting bored with this interpretation, guys, but don't. It's very important. So you know that your parabola is doing the thing. But of course, when it is not shifted, it's actually doing it at the origin. That you also need to know. But I've done a, a video on a parabola, so I do a little bit more detail. Just a little bit more. It's not too much detail. So we expect a graph that is smiling, that is not shifted horizontally or vertically, but it sits right side by side the origin. Okay, not a problem. Um, then we have here, okay, let's first check. That is F. Yes, it's exactly how we expect it. Um, G of X is an, is an exponential function with that one. So what is A here? Our a is greater than 0. It's effectively 1 when it's not written. So what do you expect? The graph should be above the horizontal asymptote. We only have a horizontal asymptote for an exponential function. And we only have a vertical asymptote for a logarithmic function. Again, I, I've done a video on those together. So you should be able to find them in the channel or check others who probably do a better job as well now let's look at this one so our x here and this is our y so what we know here is this is not shifted vertically or horizontally so that means our horizontal asymptote is the x-axis but now what is the characteristics of b b which is the base of that exponent in that power okay so um now if base b is less than 1, greater than 0, which is that case here, with a greater than 0, it means, but remember this is not alone, it's together with a positive a, with b looking like this, we know that the function is a decreasing function. So it does that. As you move from left to right, it decreases. So do we see something like it? Voila! Kion and that. Alright, the point a lies on the graph of g, okay? can see maybe we'll need it for something but they already gave us the equation I wonder all right let's look ahead and say is there any more no there's no more at this point let's just get to the questions determine the equation of the inverse of x the inverse sorry determine the equation of f inverse at x the inverse of f okay in the form y equals proof remarks but remember the question says determine so we have to show if they said write down it would be easier but now we have to actually do the show so we're doing question 5 5.1 5 we know that f of x is 2x squared this implies that the inverse is going to be such that we have x equals 2y squared you switch the two and then you solve for y which also implies that y squared is equal to x over two ne? therefore y is going to be plus or minus the square root of x over two ne? this is the whole thing all right but now here's the problem once you introduce a square root sign Remember, you have to think about this situation. Is it going to be a function, therefore? It doesn't look like it. But now, how do we make it a function? We can make it a function by knowing that we always want real values, right? Now, for us to get real values of whatever y is, we know that x must not be a negative number. Remember, we don't accept a negative under the square root sign because that is undefined so x cannot be negative but two for this to be a function x cannot be zero i mean you know that whatever if you have a power of something ne? say power of base x to the exponent two you know that this x cannot be zero either 
So it can't be negative, it can't be zero. So at this point, if this is zero, then we don't have a function for y. So if it is negative, it is undefined. So x must be greater than or equal to zero for this. No, 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 no. Why am I saying equal to? We can't have a function if x is zero. So x must be greater than zero here for this to work, okay? So I hope that makes sense, guys. Um, and x, of course, an element of real numbers or whatever. So it's fine. I think we are done here. So the key here is these two, right? The actual answer and restriction. So there's no equal sign. I was making a mistake. And then, of course, for that switch, usually that should be enough. Okay. 5.2. What do we have here? For which values of x will log of x to the base a third be less than or equal to 0, greater than or equal to minus 2? Hold on. We have a minus 2 there on the x. And this is the inverse of this function. Now let's find out what would be the graph of the inverse because they're essentially asking you and I to consider the inverse function to this and then look where is it less than and equal to zero greater than and equal to two but because we know that the inverse will have that a swept out I was wondering why is this a just mentioned and nothing else about it so we're going to use this one to our advantage okay so sometimes to do an algebraic calculation all the time is not gonna work all the time is it Especially here, I will try and see if it works, but sometimes certain expressions need a bit more. Maybe here we should have shown that this is 1. Yeah, I knew something was not right. So this is 1. Remember the exponential function always cuts the y-axis at 1. Why is that? If you say x is 0, for example, so any base to the exponent 0 is 1. So that is why it is 1 over there. So this function will look like this. Again, guys, play with this. Practice this a lot in your textbooks, study guides, whatever, question papers. At times, it helps to really work on your study guides and your question papers because, I mean, sorry, your textbooks because a lot of these basics are nicely put out in there. Once you are done, you finished the chapter, you finished all the exercises and cumulative exercises, what you need to do is to then take papers. But you can't really go to papers without having finished your work in your study guides, in your, uh, just say worksheets, whatever you have, you must finish those things step by step first before you attempt papers because the only problem you will experience if you do that so you can say a prime is going to be the switch right we switch y for x so not a problem so it is the inverse right so this is log of x to the base 3 my log doesn't want to come out nicely so it's the inverse of this function and you know that these two are symmetrical about the line y is equal to x which passes right over here and it will be exactly where they cross each other ne yeah bo yeah bo so this is y equal to x which is the inverse line all right now we can already tell here guys that look this is going to be minus 2 up here and then this is 9 over there now when is this function, we're saying less than 9, sorry, less than 2, no, no, less than 0 or equal to 0. It is equal to 0 at 1. And when is it less? And then it's beyond 1. It becomes negative, negative. Up until that point when it is 9, we're getting a minus 2. And that is our limit because we don't want further so we can't go there so basically the question is define this region in terms of x so if you answer that you will see now that x must be less than 
or equal to 9 because when it's like that it gives us minus 2 or a, a value bigger than minus 2 which is what they want but it must also be greater than or equal to 1 because when it is 1 it is 0 which is part of the inequality and then it is greater beyond 1 so this is just that domain over there all right so you get your two marks here and then of course I think the extra mark is the sketch like they said whenever guys you use a tool please show it usually in your answer sheets you have the sketch here so you can just draw that graph and label it and then you can you can say here just see the sketch the inverse function of drawn in therefore you know you follow your things and it makes life easy uh, I think that is the best way we can answer that then let's say shows it, it says now simplify the following okay so we can go about it what is f of x sorry of 1 over x so that means where you see x you substitute with that so this is 2 into 1 over x this is squared plus 1 over f of x that is 2x squared plus the inverse of x we saw that it was a plus or minus the square root of x over 2 all right so they are saying this thing is squared okay let's simplify here this is going to be squared so this is 2 into 1 over x squared so it's going to be 2 over x squared plus that one stays x squared now remember when you square something whether it's a plus or a negative it becomes positive it's always positive so now squaring here removes the square root sign so we're going to have x over 2 all right we have ourselves our fractions algebraic fractions now we're looking for what is there an lc is there an uh, what you call a cd common denominator or do we have an lcm now we can see that we do actually have a common denominator which is 2x squared why because this can accommodate itself can accommodate that can accommodate 2 so we have a cd instead of an lcm all right so let's go about it how many times does that go to in fact you just say this divide by that maybe that is the best way to say how many times it goes it can give someone a few problems as to how do I do that just always take this and divide by the denominator there so this divide by that you can see x squared cancels you remain with 2 2 you multiply that means the quotient there you multiply it with um, your numerator so 2 times 2 is 4 plus this divide by that is 1 1 times the numerator is 1 plus this divide by 2, 2 cancels, you remain with x squared, x squared multiplied by the numerator, you get x cubed, then we just sort out the top is 5 plus x cubed over 2x squared, can we move further than this, I don't think so, so we can stop here, because I just said simplify, so that is as easy as that, but I think, um, critical here is maybe this and that this was pretty straightforward and then maybe the answer here this is where the three marks are everything else was a means to an end all right cannot be rewarded for it okay already done this one so going to question eight Okay, guys, let's try and nail this thing in this next hour. I don't want to go beyond just one hour. All right, guys, let's look at this one here. Question 8 says, the graph of the second derivative of x equals mx plus c. We know it's linear, okay? Great stuff. It's sketched below. Now if we look at this one, what do we see? It has a positive gradient. Okay, if the graph of the second derivative registers a positive gradient, 
it therefore tells us that our a was greater than zero. I mean, I know this one is not normally said, but you must have noticed if you did not already. Uh, that means, say if you have x cubed, that is positive, the first derivative is going to have 3x squared. And then what about the third derivative is going to have 6x. So do you see that sign doesn't change because the exponents that you multiply by are positive. Okay. So if that was already positive, then you know that once the gradient of your second derivative is positive, it means our a here was greater than 0. And if a is greater than 0, but I mean we know this from looking at that graph, nothing else. So it means our graph is something like this. Of course this is the standard one, but we just want the shape. We don't really want too much. That being x and that being y, then that is the origin here. Okay, great. So we already know that, well, once we see a positive gradient in the second derivative function, we know that our sketch of the graph looks like this. Okay, so these things, guys, are noteworthy. So always, 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 whenever you're given something, work it out, work it out. And in fact, what is the value of this gradient? Do we really need it at this point? Mm, yeah, maybe. I mean, this is, if you look at this point, it's going to be 0 and 6. Here we have minus 1 is to 0. So those points are like that. So we can work out the gradient between any two points on, a, on the same line. Because what are those points called? In analytical geometry, they are called collinear points. Co meaning they belong in the same line, as in collinear. Co, they are together. Linear meaning in the same line. All right. Uh, a little bit too much there, but not really important. Okay, we can see this is a cubic function. Of course, that is its y-intercept, but we can't really do much at this point. Great stuff. So is there anything more we want to say? Not at this point. Oh, there is more. The graph of f is decreasing where t, sorry, where x is less than or equal to 1, x greater than or equal to t. So what does that mean, guys? Think about it. If you already established what your scratch looks like, ne? this is just an idea. When is this graph decreasing? Because as you, you read the graph from left to right, okay? So as you move from left to right, this graph is increasing, increasing, and then it stops, becomes stationary for a moment there, then it starts decreasing, 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 it stops momentarily, and then it starts increasing, 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 and increasing, and, 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 and. So it's only decreasing between these two points, which is the turning points. So do you see that? So it's only decreasing there. So it tells you that one must be here, and t must be there. Of course, these are the x-coordinates. Okay? So this tells us these are the x-coordinates. So we can say t and 1 are x-coordinates of the turning point. Great. So that is fine, guys. Um, so, now, that is very important. And of course, you already know that this intercept here, the x-intercept of the second derivative function, actually marks the point of inflection. But now we're not sure whether it's up or below, but that gives us the x-coordinate of the point of inflection. Okay, Bafuet, so I think they have given us a lot in just a few structures. Again, remember I used to tell you that when you get this uh, expression, always look in the terms of the, what you expect to find. You see, we found something else, but it's related to it. And you see, by using the very same relation, we were able to extrapolate what we need and to even know what is going on, to even understand the significance of this domain that they gave us. All right. 
I think here at this point we are ready to start answering guys. I wish to be common. I wish to be a little corner. I to be a little corner. I wish to be a little corner. I wish to be a little corner. I to be a little corner. Okay, 8.1. Determine the equation of the second derivative. Great. So we've got two points. So we can handle that nice and easy. So we can say, well, f double prime of x is equal to uh, m x plus c. Ne? That is what they gave us at first. We can say uh, m is equal to y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. Finally, I use the ones and the twos because I, I don't want to name them a and b. They, they were not named, so I tend to use what I'm given unless I really am pushed. So I'll use that big one as the one. So it's going to be 6 minus 0 divided by 0 minus into minus 1. This is effectively 6. Ne. All right. That is our m. We can say, but f double prime of x cuts the y. This was supposed to be y. x is at at 6, sorry. You can say given on the graph. So therefore we know that this function is going to be 6x plus 6. Sort, 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 sort. We are sorted here. Alright, so okay, you can say such that you know, sometimes I like saying a bit, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. But I mean, not in the English class, but, <laughs> but, uh, whatever, man. Whatever. So that was given, I mean, we just reiterated it, but we wanted to use it just to our own advantage. Ne? So how many marks there too for the gradient and for the equation? Very stingy people there. You must write for 200 guys, like we did. I mean, no, paper one for higher grade was 200 marks. And we also wrote for 200 in the second paper. So we wrote for 400. So I think the IEB is doing that. So come on, guys, take it back to 200 and so that these guys can have a fair share of good marks. Stand a better chance to pass as well. I mean, you know from statistics, the more values you have or variables you have, the more clear it is what you are observing. But when you take a very small sample, you may think you have an idea, but it's actually not there, right? Right, so we need to really start pulling those that actually get to be lost in the cracks of this little small sample that we're dealing with. I mean, 150 is not enough. That was for standard grade. But these questions have a little bit of a higher grade inclination, which I believe now you end up doing more for less, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to talk too much here. Write down, again, they're saying just write down the x value of the point of inflection of f. Wonderful. What do you know that? It is that point over there. Why? It's the x intercept of the second derivative function. We know that it is so. We know that it is so. So 8.2, we know that x is equal to minus 1. They said write down, so no need to put any explanations. But again, from revising that uh, cubic function, you would know that certain things are nicely stated there. OK. Now it says, uh, use the graph of the second derivative of x to determine the x values of x for which the graph is concave up and provide a reason for your answer okay now what do you know guys and um, there is something you need to know that well this function here 
it's the same gradient throughout but it is negative in this segment when, what do you what do I mean by negative it takes the negative y values so this is minus y whatever that value is okay it's minus y all the way until that x intercept but what happens above that point do you see this graph here as it moves up 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 what are the corresponding y values for each point it's a plus y it's a plus y whatever y value it is so do you see as the graph takes positive y values we know that by definition it says our graph is concave up so when the second derivative function registers positive y values because the gradient is constant you can't focus on that for this particular uh, parameter or property so you want to use the actual y values so as they are positive then we know that from this point to the left the graph is concave up okay now they're saying we must use this function of course we want the x value so the x values for that situation only start after minus one in that direction so we can say here 8.3 uh, we know that x must be greater than minus one because at minus one it is neither concave up nor concave down that is the point of inflection or that is the transition point between the two concavities okay so that is the story and then what is the reason here they wanted a reason we can say a cubic graph is concave up when the second derivative is greater than zero greater than zero I mean remember f double prime x is essentially y okay but we mean the y values of the second derivative function when they are greater than zero then we know that well when do we start to see those positive y values when x is greater than one because we want x values for which the corresponding y values are positive basically that is the answer I mean that is the question one so again two marks before two all right so 8.4 show that p equals 1 q equals 3 and r equals minus 9 show all calculus all right five marks so we're going to do some serious fight okay okay we can fight now we are warriors we have been in the battle for a while so this is a nothing so 8.4 fine what is the function of x the function of x is given as p x cubed plus q x squared plus r x minus 27 okay so remember there's two derivatives that we need to consider We're already given the third so let's find out what would be the second one this implies that our first derivative is going to be equal to 3 p x squared plus 2 q x plus r ne? because a derivative of the constant is zero which also implies that our first derivative is going to be equal to multiply that in front is going to be 6px plus 2q so we are sorted so these derivatives are like that in terms of what we were given that is important to remember uh, oh, this bank is crazy man it says I have unused funds I don't want to use them, eh? <laughs> I don't want to use them funds, but for it, I need to use them. I 
So, I'm in Ayo, Nimali. You're Kangala. I'm in Fires Quality. Come now to Quality. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Anyway, uh, but there's a part of way to ish, the sky and his own things. I'm doing my own things. I'm creating my own. <laughs> hey, Baba. I, I need you again. I'm um, Kenyans are looking tender eye of heads. All right, about what? Next one, we know that, but we just found out above that this second derivative is 6x plus q. I went a man, some pray along with you at all. Go six. Why do we say that? We determined above, right? We did. We determined this one that the second derivative function was actually this one algebraically now look at this one here's the magic in this thing look at this one remember there's an x there's an x there and then what comes before x is the constant which is the gradient the coefficient of x is the gradient that means these two are equal Yes, 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 yes. So you see, sometimes comparisons. I think this technique was demonstrated in some of the quadratic uh, series, quadratic sequence calculations. I think I've done one, paper one materials or something. So this would be a constant because once you know the value of Q, this becomes effectively a constant. So it goes with a constant. So these two are equal. Of course, you're not going to do this in the exam, okay? Don't do those arrows and stuff. All you have to do is to say, therefore, 6p is equal to 6, and 2q is equal to 6, okay? Yes. Uh, do you really want to have a reason? Honestly, no. I can say... Is there a reason you can provide? Maybe let's not. Let's just leave it alone. They understand where you took it from. So this follows that P is 1. And Q is going to be 6 divided by 2 is 3. So do you see our P is positive? Positive 1. So we're not getting what we did not expect, guys. But I think this is a higher grade question. I mean, I've never really seen this type of a question being asked like that. I don't think it's immediately easy to think about it. Just like that one I just mentioned from um, question three or two, which is um, the quadratics that needed this kind of a comparison. I mean, those are not standard grade questions. They're definitely higher grade questions and they really require a bit more comfortability with some complex stuff. Okay, guys, now we are sorted. We've sorted two values. Now, what about R? Now, it follows that since we established that, well, one of the turning points has the x-coordinate of 1. And we know that this should be the turning point because this is the domain during which this... But I wish they said is strictly decreasing so that we can tell that there's nothing else that is happening between that interval except the decreasing because just decreasing alone what if we zoomed into between this point of inflection and that one and then it's decreasing really so i'm a bit unhappy with this one to some extent but i guess once they put those equal signs there they're trying to suggest that those are the limits of this decreasing state of our graph but we can use this point sorry we can use that point now to our advantage to find. We can say, however, however what? We know that F prime 1. So F prime at 1 is equal to 0. Why do I know that? If it is a turning point, of course it's a turning point. A turning point given that the function is decreasing 
between x at t and x at uh, let's just say 1. So that statement that they gave us, I mean you can just write it like that and say da 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 da. Sometimes it shows that you understand. Because yeah, there's no better way sometimes of putting things. And then what is our first derivative is this one. Yay when. This implies that we have 6 into, no no no, we have 3 there. There's a 3. So there's a 3. P we just found out is 1 into x, now x is 1, that is squared, plus 2 into q, that was 3, and then into x, which I said, this is f at 1, okay? Then plus r is equal to 0. This follows that we have 3 here, plus 6, plus r is equal to 0. Therefore, our r is just that added and transposed it's minus 9. Alright, so is it not what they wanted from us? Definitely. Definitely. So we did it guys. We did it. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Now how many marks there? Five. Of course these values are important. The three marks come from them. But I believe I believe uh, ish, there's a lot of steps here though so we can say this substitution here is the fourth mark and I think this statement is powerful without it we are dead or doomed so we can go and take those five marks and keep moving we're almost an hour in so 85 says Hence, or otherwise, determine the value of t. This takes us again to the first derivative function. Now that we know everything here, we can just work it out. Because those are the turning points, isn't it? So 8.5. We know that f of, I mean, f prime of x is going to be equal to, now we're putting the values where they belong. So it's 3 times 1 is going to be 3x squared. Then we found 3 for q, so it's going to be plus 6x. Then we got minus 9 there. This is what it is. And then we can say at, uh, let's just say, uh, what can I say? Hmm, how do I put t? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's just say at the turning point. It is such that this thing is zero, Baba. I'm just prolonging this. I mean, just trying to be fancy. 3x squared. This implies 3x squared plus 6x minus 9 is equal to 0, which also implies that, uh, okay, let's divide by 3 here first. That is important, otherwise it's going to mess with us. 3, okay, this is going to be x squared plus 2x minus 3 equal to 0, which also implies that we factorize this thing. Okay, because I want the middle term to be positive, so the bigger number must carry the positive sign. Therefore, x is equal to 1, or x is equal to minus 3. Therefore, x at t, or t, yeah, let's just say x at t is equal to minus 3. That's the one that we want, because we can already tell that at 1, this is already ahead of t, but the domain is always put for the coordinate that is before that one. So t is before 1, so we cannot choose 1, and then, you know, that's not how you write the domain. So again, the notation gives you an idea as to which one to choose. All right, guys, this is fine. How many marks? There are three marks. I think giving that determination... And 
Hmm. I guess this one is correct. Sometimes it's very difficult to find where the marks are. But I think the most powerful is this statement also. The rest is just maths. Alright guys, let's let's quickly 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 quickly. Eesh, I keep saying quickly but I'm not moving quickly at all. Eh, let's not use that word. It's now a misnomer when I am involved because my quick is just slow. Maybe the more I say less, the more I move. Okay, for which values of x will f of x multiplied by the second derivative function be greater than or equal to zero? So, here we need our f of x. Ne? First of all, so 8.6, you can see it's 5 marks, so we need to do some work f of x is going to be what? p is 1, so this is x cubed. Plus, we got q to be 3, so this is going to be 3x squared. We got r to be minus 9, so this is minus 9x, and then minus 27. So that is how our f of x looks like. Okay. Great stuff. Um, now, we need to do something about this because we need to factorize it I mean we can't really do this product if we have it factorized this thing right so let's see we can say but what f of whatever must give us zero so let's determine that what could it be so you start by putting one in there so you can say one Ah, uh, but one is not going to work, ne? Mm -mm. This is already going to be big if we put one, so it's not going to work. We can't use one. Let's start by minus two, for example. Say minus two into x, I mean, minus two cubed plus three into minus two squared minus nine into minus two minus twenty-seven. Yo, getting minus 5. Okay, let's try minus 3. Minus 3 into x cubed. So not into x cubed, but minus 3 cubed. Let's cube it. Let's cube it. Minus 3 squared. Minus 9 into minus 3. Minus 27. Yebo, kinoto. So that means if we put minus 3 here, if f of minus 3 is 0, it follows that x plus 3 is a factor of f. How do we know that? Remainder. No, 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 no. Factor theorem. There's a theorem for paper 1, eh? Factor theorem. <laughs> hey, yeah, ne? That's m nandi, m nandi, m nandi, m nandi. Alright. Um now this implies that F of x is given by x plus 3 into we know that we're going to have some quadratic here that of course we can follow that if we want 27 here we already have a 3 here this must be a minus 9 right and then here we're obviously going to get an x squared of some sort né? now the question is we need to find the middle terms but you can choose this term or you can choose that term. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to choose this one for me to work out what should be in between here. Now I'm going to multiply x with 9. So I get minus 9x, which is already what I want. And then 3 must multiply with what for me to remain with this 9? It means it must multiply with 0. So 
I'm going to say plus zero there. <laughs> Looks strange, ne? Yeah, sometimes strange things happen all the time. Which is effectively x plus 3 into x minus 9. Sorry, x squared minus 9. So this is the difference of two squares here, which is fine. So this is x plus 3 into, we can then factorize the difference of two squares. We can put x plus 3 and x minus 3. It will take us back and that one will take us back there. So we are sorted. We wanted to actually factorize our f of x because we know that this is already a function. We can say therefore f of x times f double prime of x to be greater than or equal to 0 implies that we have this here x plus 3 into x plus 3 into x minus 3 into the f function here the f double prime there is 6x plus 6 is greater than or equal to 0 alright guys so I'm just setting up my what is that table called anyway it's not my table by the way it's Mr. Laridon's table <laughs> the Larid Mr. Laridon is one of the authors of the classroom mathematics that we used back in the days I mean that pink book the standard nine I learned that table there on that book so old books before it are good trust me they are way too good because what they had working that time is still working today but I don't know if I can say the same about things of today, if they will still be working tomorrow. Ah, it doesn't matter, guys. It's not a big deal. So, folks, you can tell that we have equal roots here, but I don't really care. I have one, two, three, four factors here. These are factors. So I can actually put them into that table. I don't know what that table is called anyway. So, And it's not mine also, so I cannot own it. I cannot claim it. It's just the table I know. We have x plus 3, x plus 3. Just put them as they are. Don't put 1. You're going to be in trouble. This table says you put everything there is. You're not going to put what you choose. Okay, we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4. But of course, these ones are the same. So we're going to have, which one is the smallest is minus 3. So we have minus 3 here, then the h, no, 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 there's going to be 1 here. Okay, 1 is bigger than minus 3, so in between we have 1. So these are your critical values. You just equate each one of these to 0 to get your critical values. And then the other one is going to be positive 3. So now that, now that we've set up our table, we can work out this factors. This one at minus 3 is going to be 0 as well as that one. Ne? Beyond minus 3, say 0 for example, this is still positive. So we're going to have a positive value there. When it's 1, it's positive. When it's 2, it's positive. When it's 3, it's positive. Beyond 3, it's still positive. If you establish one side, it's consistently positive. The opposite side cannot be otherwise. But check in case you made an error there. Uh, of course, if you put a minus 4 here, sign of the bigger number leaves this one as negative. So we're interested about the signs per se, but using some values as our, you know, we latch onto those things. So this is going to be the same, right? Because it's the same factor. Okay. This one, at 3, is going to be 0. Then beyond 3, you put a 4 there, you get a positive value. And you put a number less than that, you put a 0, you have a negative, 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 and negative. Yeah. This one is 0 at 1, because if you put 1 in the, sorry, did I say 1? Minus 1. A1. We go Zimfana 1. Hey, 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 hey. Because when you transpose this, you get minus 6 divided by 6 is minus 1. Yes. Hey, hey, hey. goes. Then beyond this one, you put a 0 there. This is a plus. So it's going to be plus and plus. And then what happens below this one? You put, say, 
Did I say put a zero there? A number bigger than, yeah. If you put, say, minus 2, this becomes minus 12. So we have a negative, negative, negative. Now this is a product of all of this, so we don't have to worry. So we're going to just say negative times negative is positive. A positive times negative is negative. Negative times negative is a positive. Okay, great. Zero multiplied by any number is zero. Then a positive times a positive is positive. Times a negative, that becomes negative. Negative times a negative is a positive. Hmm. This is just a fun part. Positive times a positive is positive. Times a negative is a negative. Times zero is zero. Positive times positive is positive. Times a negative is negative. Times a positive is negative. Then any number multiplied by zero is going to be zero. Then all positives are going to give us a positive value. So what do we want? We want this product to be greater than zero or equal to zero. So it is equal to zero here. And it is greater than zero going that way because those are positive values. As well as here, actually this arrow is doing that. So do you see the... We're going all the way. We're either getting positive or zero or positive, so we are, we, are, we are happy. But here it's negative, so that's not what we want. Here it's zero, and then it's positive. It's going that way. So we can safely say that x must be less than or equal to minus 1, or x must be greater than or equal to 3. That is our answer, guys. So that is fine. Ne? Easy stuff. Easy, 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 man. But let me just show you another way you could have worked this one out. Because there's always many ways of killing a cat. It's not just one way. Maybe that table is overwhelming. Maybe you have to do a lot. But this question, you really have to do a lot. It's five marks, so yeah, there's no too short a cut you can make. Ne? So let's look at this one graphically. So we saw that there's equal roots at minus 3. Minus 3 has equal roots. That means minus 3, we also discovered that it was the turning point. And in fact, every time you find equal roots here, that means that will serve as a turning point as well. So we know that we had minus 1 here. If we have our minus 3 there, and then we have our 3 here. So then we do that fine, our graph turned at minus 27, that was the y-intercept. Okay, great stuff. And we know that there's equal roots at minus 3, and we know that it's decreasing between minus 3 and 1 here, which is the other turning point. Okay, that turning point is obviously going to be definitely below. the y-intercept because we cut here and then we turn so we're turning in this direction okay we're going that way to cut maybe let's move our minus 27 to here and then we move in that direction And then somewhere, when I'm in Manga, we dramatically enter the Kwaba sun. Get our club away. Oh, what I want to sing it and to ya, come on. Elintly so. Okay, so we have our little sketch here. I mean, be comfortable, guys, doing these sketches, even if they're not asked. So when they ask this question, it should be second nature. You must not feel like this is difficult. You must not feel like you're being tested. This is stuff you should know easily. It must be your second nature already. So this is our f function, right? But what did we know? We had ourselves a lovely function there at 6 and minus 1. That was this function. Okay. Okay, 
kwenze kile sekufana nokudali weyo ke kuba singaba senzani this is f double prime okay not a problem guys now let's assess these graphs just a little bit now we have these two graphs and then of course you have your point of inflection which we really don't care about at this point it doesn't really make much of a difference uh, the question says when we multiply y values of this function to these ones we must get a product that is positive or greater than zero so if you look at this thing here oh I forgot my axis this is x this is y that is the origin so always make sure that is clearly indicated now let's see always start from left to right buffet this is going to help you because if you look anywhere you're gonna get lost as we move from the left to the right this is negative we're talking about y values because when they write f of x that that of x is just y values we're talking about so this is a one Kogelan. We're not talking about the gradient, we're talking about y values. So do you see that is negative and negative? That one is zero there. Kanda box. But the corresponding for this one is negative. Okay? And then in this region here, they are still both negative. Okay? All the way until this one is is a little box pian, but this corresponding is negative. Now, what do you see here, guys? When you multiply negative by negative, you get a positive, right? And negative multiplied by zero, you get zero. Negative multiplied by negative is a positive. Zero multiplied by negative, you get a negative. So, do you see here that in this interval? This interval here, from here, going that way. Oh, yeah, for land, son. So you can tell that from one included, included, going backward. This satisfies that constraint that they gave us. Which satisfies that this product would be greater than or equal to zero. So we know that x must be less than or equal to minus one. That is the one. H and tata forever foot in Kali less and dozam. Being a fun as we get again and doing a creepy. You being a your plan for a way to save a little more share than just to be. In a see, it won't get any suit. In a see, my chemist said to Ark, being a in close to Yami. It was not my intention. I don't know what is intention in African, so let's leave it at right. At that right there. Okay, so fine. So, guys, we are happy with this one that we already found one of our solutions, right? Now, let's look here beyond this point. Beyond one, this graph is positive. Now type as is Oklahoma and as as back in terms as I'm says Pelel. That is positive, right? But what is this one? Beyond this point, it's negative all the way. Ah, uh, that is still positive here. That is still negative here. So a positive multiplied by negative is a negative. So this is a no-no. And then we get to this turning point. So this is still negative. And then that one is still positive. There. So do you see those things are still giving us a product that is not what we want. And we keep going until this point here. This one is zero. And if we check what would this one be here if we follow that one up some way by extending it do you see there that this one is positive that one is zero but what is that product that product is zero so that means we can consider this interval over here and then what else beyond this is positive while that one is positive so the product is positive so ooh, what did i do there that was the zero man so this is the solution going that way so we know that our x must be greater than or equal to three to satisfy this lovely 
little thingy there. So you have both methods, graphicon and algebraic table. Maybe let's call it an algebraic table. It works. Okay. Not a problem. Guys, that is how you get yourselves these five marks. Of course, if you used the sketch, you'll get a mark for sketching there. Because this one was already sketched for you. So for sketching this one, or rather indicating the points and everything like you would a graph. And then you make these conclusions. They will know you took it from there. Then they will be happy. They will be happy. So you take your five marks and you take these 18 marks that they were offering. So yeah, they were really testing these guys. Ne? Yeah, they were testing them. They were not checking you out, guys. They were testing you. I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Uh, maybe they... They decided, well, we may as well test you now. <laughs> so when we test you in December, we're testing you again. It's going to be like uh, doing what you call supplementary. <laughs> and then let me just get this paper. There are just too many here and they are sitting on my pens. Now I cannot see them well, so I don't want to scramble for my stuff. Get them away. All right, guys, let's just do this last one as fast as possible. And maybe, maybe we may just be slightly over this first hour rather than to take a whole two hours. Eh? Hi, hi. So, my intention. So, let's do this one, guys. Okay. Now, question nine says the soldier is. Okay, this is the guy. He's probably lying there with that little thingy, that helmet of theirs. Mangara there, this is the guy, he's lying down there. <laughs> Maybe he's even having so much fun that the other leg is looking down. So there is this hand. And then he's holding this little thing, and almost they put their AKs with that little thingy there. He's going to shoot somebody. Hey, <laughs> hey, you got your fish, le? <laughs> hey, yeah, de, he's trying to adjust his thing. There, there is that thing. Gonna be like, Phew! trying to shoot something there. Okay, so he's at point S, the sky. Okay, point S is effectively the origin of our Cartesian plane. Okay, 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 it's fixed. I mean shoots at a fixed target TQ, okay, on the crest or the highest point of the hill. Now the height of the hill is represented by the equation. I feel like they should not say the height of the hill, but the hill itself, because this is a parabola, this is quadratic, and this represents the entire hill that we see. But anyway, maybe they're just looking at the profile of that hill, and that's why they're saying the height, because they're looking at a side view, perhaps. Let's take it for that. Then this is between uh, 3 and 1. Of course, this should be the intercept, I'm sure. Let's work them out. When we factorize this thing, it's going to be minus x into, let's find out. Of course, for us to get it a 4 there, we must have a 3 somewhere and a 1. Now the question is, if this is negative and we want that to be positive, 3 must be negative and 1 must be positive. So I'm going to multiply that there, it becomes a plus 3 plus 1. Where's my x? My x is missing. Okay. So the roots here, when you solve, you're going to get 1 and 3. So these are the roots ready. Okay, so that is just me trying to find out what are they trying to refer to that for. Because if they were talking about this, then it would be nice. But now we don't know what that point P is. Okay. Now they are saying P is a point on the hill. All right. And you can tell that this point P, this is essentially a tangent. Okay, let's use another color. It's going to mess up. This is effectively a tangent to P. I mean to the curve at P. And you can tell that if this guy aims for this tangent, 
he will hit that. That means he needs this angle. He can get this angle, he has this gradient and he will actually chip the heel with the bullet and it will end up on that thing. But don't play with guns. Hey, those things are destructive and dangerous. Keep going, Simon. Okay. Okay, now that is the story. And then you can already tell that this target is placed at our turning point. The x coordinate is halfway between these two. 3 plus 1 is 4 divided by 2 is 2. But what we don't know is this one. which is 90 degrees. That one is also 90 degrees. Ne? So we don't know this one. Okay, not a big deal. So they are saying here, uh, write an expression for the gradient of the hill in terms of x. Great. Now the question is, we know the hill is the parabola. So the first derivative at any point in the parabola will give us the gradient at any point on that curve. So we look for the first derivative there. They just said write down, so we're not going to explain too much. we we'll just write. So question 9, we have 9.1. So we're going to say here h of x, I mean h prime of x is going to be minus 2x plus 4. That is what would give us the first derivative, and then of course this gives us the gradient of the heel. So one mark. All right, not a problem. The next question says, what is the smallest angle that is minimum? Once you hear minimum, you know you're going to have to differentiate somewhere, somehow. The minimum angle, theta, that the soldier can aim to shoot the target. When we say minimum, that means the first angle that you get to, such that it's enough to hit that, because there can be other angles. You can go to this one, for example. It's much bigger than theta. You will still be able to probably take the top of that. So we want the smallest, the very first angle that, because I mean, if he's doing this, he misses. He does this, he misses. He does that, he gets it. So that is the very first angle. So minimum. So once you hear that smallest or minimum, you know, differential calculus are going to take part here. So now how are we going to handle this? Well, we don't know point P and we need coordinates of point P because this is where this line is a tangent to this curve. And we already know an expression for that to help us, but now we don't have the x coordinates. But now we can say point P is x. Ne? If that is x, what is the corresponding y value? The corresponding y value is actually the function, so it's going to be minus x squared plus 4x minus 3, right there. Because whatever x value we have, if we substitute that, it will give us the y value, right there. So those are the coordinates of p in terms of x. And what are the coordinates of the origin? Is 0 is to 0. So we've got two points. We can der derive an expression to do that gradient in this triangle here. The technique is that we want this triangle first as our means to an end and then once we have that then we can work out simultaneously from knowing that this gradient can still be represented by the first derivative. I think if we do simultaneous equations there we can solve for x and then once we have x we will have the gradient. Now, knowing trigonometry, we can use the tangent because 10 theta gives us the gradient. So then we can actually solve theta that way. All right, we will start here by saying k, 9.2. We can say, let p be x is 2 minus x squared plus 4x minus 3. Of course, you will have drawn these things into your sketch so that somebody understands what you're doing. We can say, therefore, the gradient of OP, we can say M OP is going to be equal to uh, 
y at p minus y at o divided by y x at p minus x at o which is um, minus x squared plus 4x minus 3 minus 0 because at o is 0 and then at that one we have x minus 0 which is effectively minus x squared plus 4x minus 3 all over x okay great now we we are happy we can say though but m o p is equal to h prime of x why is that buffered we know that the gradient of the tangent equals the gradient And just say equals the gradient of the curve at a point which is P in this case all right not a problem so now we've convinced someone who is a naysayer so we can simply substitute the two what was that this was minus x squared plus 4x minus 3 all over x this is equal to, we found out that h prime of x was that, so it's going to be minus 2x plus 4. Then this one is over 1. When you have fractions, just try to do that. Then we cross multiply, which implies this is going to be minus x squared plus 4x minus 3 equals minus 2x squared plus 4x. Then we can just take everything to the other side then this becomes positive so plus 2x squared minus x squared it leaves us um, just x squared ne? Mm -hmm. and then when we move this one these ones carry the positive sign I mean the same signs about this one so it's terrible it doesn't help us at all and then what do we end up with guys so ugh, there's nothing else left so we can effectively transpose this constant to this side which also implies that x is going to be we take the square root of each it's going to be plus or minus the square root of 3 but remember x is in the positive x axis so we can't take the negative so we can say therefore x is equal to the square root of 3 not a problem now that we know the value of x we want the gradient at the point we can say it follows that therefore that the gradient so h prime of x is going to be equal to minus 2 into root 3 plus 4 which is going to be minus 2 root 3 plus 4 at this point you don't want to rush and you can also say therefore the gradient of the tangent is going to be the same minus 2 root 3 plus 4 I mean it's just tautology I'm repeating the very same thing over and over and over and over sometimes you don't really need this okay let's just finish it off here let's just create some working space here so from here we can say effectively therefore 10 theta is equal to the gradient of the tangent right which is minus 2 root 3 plus 4 and say therefore theta is going to be equal to arc 10 minus 2 root 3 plus 4 let us see now what is that so arc 10 minus 2 root 3 plus 4 I get 28 comma 19 degrees now you make a conclusion there for the soldier K 
can aim at an angle of 28,19 degrees to shoot the target. All right, guys, it's fine. I mean, I'm just being as comprehensive as possible, but it's not a big deal. But what is key here is getting this gradient here and making this association and actually substituting them and solving for this guy. So four marks here is wonderful. And then, um, I think I can give you a mark for that one and for the answer. I mean, six marks is everywhere, so it's quite a lot. And there's a lot of steps we used. Maybe if you try and cap the steps, then you can be in a good position. All right, guys, this is how these guys were tested. I, I think they were tested more than truly evaluated whether they were ready for the finals or not. This was a true test, so perhaps those guys believe in their syllabus. Or, I mean, they believe in how well they teach their students, so they knew that we can actually give them a test, like a final. All right, guys, I hope you liked the video. Thank you very much for your patience to watch, even when I am really, really, really doing a serious number on you guys by wasting your time talking a lot of things, sometimes saying, I mean, stupid things, crazy things, <laughs> irrelevant things, but you still have the interest to continue watching because, yeah, that itself is reassuring. All right, guys, good luck with your preparations for your finals. Please work hard and it is almost there. Otherwise, I'll be there together with the others who do a lot of work. By the way, uh, I said in the last video I was going to tell you which people to have a look at if you really want to, you know, learn a few more concepts that you probably haven't learned already. I'll just mention a few so that you can just check their videos. I think they are very good from looking at what they do. It's, it's excellent. For maths, all right, you can check Mr. Armin Hendricks. His channel is Maths with Armin. I think the man has a PhD in maths. If he doesn't have it already, he's probably on his way to getting one. He's too good. Too good. If I was to have a teacher like him, I was never going to have troubles with maths at all. So check him out. Uh, he does a lot of maths you know, concepts that are very, very, very important. And the way he presents them is excellent. Honestly, you cannot fault the man. Uh, the second person to have a look at is um, Lungi Simkosi. I think Mr. Mlu is a giant himself. Uh, he probably also holds some higher order qualification in maths and physics. He does a great work. So you want to look at him. He's an all-rounder. He does both maths and physics. So you can have a look there. Please, guys, you still have a bit of time. Try to make sure in this week you do as much as you can so that you don't leave out a lot of work for later when you're already panicking. You want for later to try and relax a bit knowing you've covered your bases. Ne? And then uh, the other group of people who are very good is MV Tutors. Ne? MV Tutors. I think those guys are doing a lot of work. I mean, they have a family, but they find time to do some work for you guys. So that is commendable. Uh, you will learn a lot there. They have lessons, they have videos, past papers and all that. So you will learn. So I have seen them. They are, they're, they're very good. So you will learn a lot from them too. There's uh, another guy, Mets. I think that guy is a Mets prodigy or prodigy or prodigy. Yeah, he's a genius. Levi. I think his channel is Bright Young Brains. The guy is doing excellent work. I've seen his videos. They are super good. So you want to do that guy. I mean, he works hard. I mean, you can do a whole paper to go. I cannot do that. So is very good so you want to go there especially if you want preparation for your exams I mean it does also have apparently a website where 
you can sign into some courses that he, he runs there so you can learn as much as you can there and then you can have um who's the other person that i saw hey there's a lot though but i think a lady who presents for a channel or it's her channel it says nte i think that lady is excellent ah yeah yes yeah, she's, she's a giant she's a giant i think she also is one of those people who probably have done maths at a higher level than metric and probably are still pursuing it further because she is excellent very elaborate very eloquent and to the point i mean she's very clear so guys i think i have seen a few but there's plenty more trust me all these people i mentioned are just to scratch the surface there's a lot of good guys there who are trying their best to give you guys as much as you can have because trust me your education is now our priority those of us who made it through the same you know education system know very well what are the challenges in there hence we are trying our best to give a hand to you guys so that you can have a better chance than we probably did okay guys i'm not gonna say too much i mean there's just a lot to talk about but there's not enough time for that so bye bye for now i'll see you in the next videos which i'll probably do maybe one on functions again just to tie some knots there and there to show you you know what we have been doing that it's truly something that you want to consider trying to use as much as possible of course not neglecting or negating other techniques that you probably are exposed to and then yeah maybe i'll look at the trick functions just a little bit to try and give you an intel on to how to handle those things so that maybe that is sorted and then yeah maybe these functions as well we can just have a look at a few more examples and yeah that should be enough of it because i think we've done enough videos on other sections of maths and physics so i feel like i don't want to actually steal your time you need to prepare yourselves this time so i cannot be in your face all the way but i'll be next to you in spirit and give a little bit of support every now and then okay guys bye bye and good luck